Welcome to another Foss North. I would like to start by thanking our gold sponsors, our silver sponsors, our base sponsors, and our partners from the community. So next up will be Isabel, president of Inner Source Common Foundation, uh, and she will talk about Inner Source. So how to use open source policies uh, inside of an organization. Um, what I want to mention is that I posted a link to an Etherpad uh, in the comments, and she will be available there live during the talk, and she will also be available live for the Q and A session. Um, but without further ado, I'll shift over to the live recording of uh, Isabel's talk. Hello, and welcome to my talk on solving team dependencies the open source way. My name is Isabel Trost from. I'm open source strategist at Europesaki. I'm also a member of the Apache Software Foundation and co-founder and president of the InnoSource Commons Foundation. Now, if this was a regular conference um, where we could meet in person, what I would do is a quick show of hands to understand who you are and maybe even give you the microphone if it's not more than a, than a few dozen people. Now, of course, this isn't possible with every one of us sitting in front of their computers watching video streams, but I would like to still make this a bit more interactive. So I've created an Etherpad. On that, you will find several questions. We will get to each of these questions throughout this presentation. For now, what I would like to uh, have you do is to open the web page and answer the very first question. If you could have a superpower, would you prefer to be invisible or would you prefer to be able to fly and why? Okay, let's start flying. Um, if you are a software engineer, likely you've been using libraries before and likely you've run into an issue where you found a bug in that library or something that doesn't work quite right. Likely you've opened a back report and then waited for the fix to be made. I'm very certain that at some point in time you likely had the feeling of fixing that myself would have been way faster. Now what we will see in this presentation is how adopting open source collaboration best practices where fixing what's in my way is a very easy thing and contributing that fix back to open source is actually a best practice, how using this pattern within an organization can help you become more independent, more autonomous, and as a result, more lead to faster innovation. Now, during the past year, a lot of you likely were at least partially remote or fully remote. But even before the pandemic, there are uh, teams that are distributed across multiple locations who work in more than one office, who sometimes even work in more than one time zone. And sometimes you have within one team individuals that are remote. Now, open source deals with this very, very elegantly, and there are many patterns that it can um, understand and use in-house as well, if you understand how open source projects work. Now, if you know how to communicate those patterns, to your own team, you can bring what you love about open source development into your organization. Also, if you've been with an organization for a while, you've likely seen growth challenges with communication becoming ever more complex. However, if you think about what open source projects look like, some of those are very, very large. So we can look there for patterns that can help us in-house grow. But let's take a step back. Let's look at our ideal team. It should be focused, it should be motivated, and it should be challenged. So common wisdom is your team should be pizza-sized. Otherwise, if the team size grows too large, you will have um, an exponential growth in terms of one-on-one -on -one communications that is needed. So this doesn't scale very well. Also, they should, they should be um, autonomous. They should be able to deliver value to their customer without depending on 
external factors, especially without depending on a ton of other teams. So there should be less handoff and teams should be multidisciplinary so that they can ship value without handing it over to further stages along your development chain. So essentially, they should be focused on their product, um, working iteratively to provide value. Except in the real world, we are not quite as independent from each other. If you work on a platform, at some point in time, you have to integrate different pieces. If you build, build even if you build multiple mo modules for your customers, you still want to have some level of co coordination so that the user experience from one module is roughly comparable to the user experience of another module, um, so that both of those do not use different um, different usability patterns but such that it still feels like one product. But even going one step further, likely you will not never build your so uh, software from scratch. You will always depend on external systems, on external components. Even if it's just a tiny open source library, you are not entirely independent. But there are a few more challenges that you're faced with as a team. Sooner or later, you will have to onboard new people. So these people will have to learn your tech stacks. They will have to understand how to build the system, how to make extensions. However, they will also have to understand your cult team culture. And that means understanding a lot of unwritten rules. Now, I know the technical documentation itself often is lacking, but typically uh, how we communicate, how we make decisions, all of that tends to be implicit. So that is something that people have to learn going from organization to organization. As your team and as your organization grows, you will also run into a challenge with communication overload. So at some point, the approach of if you have a problem, you'd simply go to Bob and ask them a question doesn't work anymore. In open source, we have a solution for that. We don't do one-on-one -on -one communication. If you have a question about an Apache project, as we've heard earlier, you don't go to the individual committer asking a question. What you do is to go to a mailing list, be it a user mailing list or a dev mailing list. So essentially, what you do is to go to a central communication hub. And what happens there is that you ask a question, the question is visible to everyone. And that includes those people who didn't dare to ask the question or didn't even think of the question of having that question. All of these people benefit from seeing the answer, the answer to your question as well. It also means that the answers you get do not only come from one person, they come from multiple people, ideally bringing different perspectives. So your answer is much less from a single person's perspective, but it's much more likely to reflect reality. At some point in time, you will also have to communicate goals. Now in open source, we do that as well. At the very simplest, each project has a mission statement, at least each larger one. In that mission statement, within a few sentences, people communicate what the project is about, what the goals of the project are, but they also communicate what, where the boundaries of that is. What that means is that as soon as you have to make roadmap decisions, as soon as you have to decide whether to include a new feature or not, you can go back to this mission statement and understand whether this extension belongs there or not. What you will also have to do is to create a culture where all of the teams are working together, where all of the teams are pulling in the same direction. Something that you want to avoid is a us versus them situation. Something else you want to be able to grow team members, both technically, but also in terms of influence. In open source projects, that's fairly easy and fairly um, built into the process. Much as referred in the Apache Way this morning, um, people simply grow 
with first uh, being users of their, their dependencies, then going on the mailing list, learning while watching others answering questions, while watching others making decisions about the project. Oftentimes this already means that those learnings can be brought back into their local teams. And they grow further when they start becoming active, answering um, questions on those mailing lists. And sooner or later, they will find themselves contributing patches and becoming part of the project. So there is a growth path built into that implicitly. And last but not least, you will somehow have to deal with technical dependencies. Now, throughout this talk, we will focus on, an, on patterns for dealing with dependencies and how InnoSource can help, help you with that. However, the solution to that um, has solutions to the other challenges as well. So let's look at it. Assume you're building the component in the middle and you have dependencies to the, to the left and to the right. It's just technical components that you build, pull into your system during build time, right? Except in reality, what it is, is dependencies to other teams. If you want to make a change, you're dependent on their roadmap, on their schedule. So you're not quite as autonomous as you thought. And in reality, it doesn't really matter if these are in-house dependencies or if these are open source dependencies. Behind each of these technical artifacts, there is a team. Now, what if you want a change to be made in one of those components? What can you do? You can wait for the fix to be made. So you go to the back tracker, you submit a back report or a feature request, and then you start waiting. Doesn't sound very autonomous, right? Doesn't sound like you yourself are in charge of fulfilling your purpose. Suddenly you're dependent on that other team. And who knows if that ever makes it on their roadmap. What you can do as well is you can cut these dependencies away. But what that means is that a lot of the work that they are doing suddenly ends up on your desk. So you can no longer move very fast, but you're slowing down substantially. So that's not a good solution either. There is a solution and everyone here who is involved with open source knows the solution. You can provide a helping hand to the other team. If you have access to the source code, if the bug tracker is open, if the team is open to receiving patches and can deal with that, it's very easy to check out the source code, makes a change, and send the patch back, right? Now, the goal is to establish this kind of working model within your organization as well. And the goal was establishing this working model, of course, for someone who's deeply into open source means that all of those software engineers who are not yet familiar with that working model suddenly become familiar with that process and suddenly it becomes much more easy for them to become active in upstream open source because as, we, as we've seen earlier there's no real difference between your internal dependency and your open source dependency. So the movement behind that is called InnoSource. There's a foundation behind it called InnoSource Commons Foundation. Um, we have a Slack channel where you can, can communicate with us, where practitioners are exchanging their lessons learned and helping each other out. There's a learning path explaining how to develop like an open source project within organization boundaries, and which also explains to those who are not familiar with open source, what the advantages of that are. And there are a ton of patterns, um, some of which apply to how to set up your inner source project and how to make it easier for, for your colleagues to get involved. But also there are patterns around how to start an inner source initiative and how to find collaborators within your organization. So essentially, it's inspired by open source, and the goal is to bring open source collaboration into corporations. But the motivation behind that, of course, is to teach more people how we in the open source world are operating, 
such that for a lot of your colleagues, it becomes much more easy to collaborate in your real open source project. So you're in the middle and it doesn't really mean matter if the people on the right and on the left are part of an open source project dependencies that you're using or if they are in-house. The goal should be that the processes are pretty much exchangeable. So why would you try to establish that? Why work in that way? It's the same reason why you should participate in open source. Essentially, it's about gaining by sharing. As soon as you participate and as soon as you give your, as you give your patch back, you will gain valuable feedback. The patch will improve. And likely people will discover where it would break in production before you put it into production. It also means that this other team will take over some of the maintenance work for your changes because they can take your changes into consideration whenever they cut a new release and whenever they make changes to their architecture. However, ultimately, if you um, think about it, what you can do with this model is that if multiple teams in your organization need the same base infrastructure, you can do the same as happened in the open source world. You can band together and you build, can build this base infrastructure together. So essentially not one team, not all of the teams have to invest all of the time in order to get this up and running, but you can do this together and share the workload. With that, you can also move faster and have more time to focus on your customers' um, requests and features. And you can innovate much faster. So what is the prerequisite? In open source, uh, the open source license is the legal prerequisite for this to work. So it should be an OC approved license. What's also much at least equally important is op open collaboration and open governance. And the open collaboration and open governance part is something that we can learn a lot from moving that model in-house. What open collaboration means is that not only the source code is open and readable and um, for everyone in the organization, it also means that all of the decisions around the source code need to be accessible. So your back tracker needs to be open. All of your uh, project-related decisions need to be taken in a format and in a place where potential contributors can read them and follow them along. It also means that role definitions uh, or roles are very transparent, such that people understand who are the people who can make a decision with respect to C roadmap and what is the preferred way of becoming involved in that decision? So much like an open source and inner source, we do have trusted committers. Now, committer always cling sounds like I am the one committing code to source control. I am the quality gate. But something that I've learned at Apache is that committer could also mean someone who's committed to the project. So it doesn't have to be just a software engineer who is a trusted committer. So what would I expect from a trusted committer? What I expect is that these people mentor and enable and invite new contributors. So they are the ones growing the team and they are the ones helping new contributors grow and gain more experience. In turn, they are the ones setting the house rules and the project direction, much like we've seen in open source, much like we've seen in the Apache way. It's the committers and the PMC members who set the house rules and project direction. What I expect from trusted committers is that they communicate openly and transparently, especially when it comes to project decisions. Without open communication, and without open discussion, there is no way for a contributor to follow your project. All they will see is the end result in terms of source code, but they don't see the design decision leading up to those commits. They don't see the discussions around design choices. 
but this is important in order to understand where the project is going. What is important is that this role is filled voluntarily. It's an invitation instead of an assignment. Invitations you can say no to. For assignments you cannot do that. But in order to be committed to the project, I expect this person to have choice. At the other end you have contributors. Your contributors typically start by using the project. And a good contributor will start uh, at the same time will start watching the project, not only the technical side, but also the discussions going around this project, all of the design discussions, all of the project roadmap discussions. At some point in time, they will make changes where they need them themselves. And likely they will contribute those changes back because simply it's cheaper to contribute them back instead of maintaining them yourself. So over time, contributors will become part of the project themselves and will become trusted committers sooner or later. And this is where some organizations have challenges because this feeds directly into how people are managed in terms of line management. Now, what we want to see is that trusted committers pull in new contributors. One prerequisite is that it's easy to contribute to the project. Oftentimes, if you see in-house projects, it's not quite easy to contribute to them. So I would like to see you think about, in an open source project, what are the things that make it easy to contribute changes? So I'll give you a minute to think about that and type it up. Okay, let's have a look. What do you need in order to make it easy? You need open communication. One of the key things that I learned at Apache is that you need to take decisions where everyone can participate. Typically, what we do in corporations is to make, the, make a meeting, take a decision there. The disadvantage is that everyone has to be on the same schedule in order to participate. People have to be roughly in the same time zone and people will have to be on the same meeting schedule so that there are no conflicts in when meetings are scheduled. If you take, if instead you make this, take decisions in writing and give a little bit of time for everyone to participate, everyone to read up, this is much more easy for others to participate. They don't have to plan their schedule around your meeting times. There's still a ton of value in meeting face-to-face -face or over video conference, simply because the bandwidth is much larger. But if you make important project decisions, it should be part possible to participate in them in a format which can be accessed in a asynchronous fashion so that people can read it up whenever they have time to do so. Another important role is the Mikasa Isukasa role. Rule. I've said before that trusted committers are the ones who are setting house rules. They are also writing down all of the things that contributors should be aware of when contrib making contributions. Of course, it shouldn't be an incredibly long list because nobody's going to read that. But obvious things that contributors will stumble over when making changes to the code base. Solutions for that should be um, found in the contribution document. Something like special flags that you should um, add when running tests. Something like um, special things that to enable in order to make building faster. All of the kind of specialties in your project so it should be in the contributing document. Also, you need a culture where it's okay to share work in progress. Imagine your contributor working for weeks and weeks on a change, submitting his their patch, and as a response, receiving a no, that's not relevant to our project. 
what kind of frustration. Now imagine instead if that contributor had felt safe to um, submit their changes very, very early on in a draft status. Trusted committers could have given them feedback early on on what to change, on whether it fits on the roadmap, on whether it fits with the mission of the project and could have helped along the way to make it fit within the architecture. So it's much less frustrating and it's much more of an interactive process where you work together as a team instead of someone hacking away um, lonely at their desk for weeks. A precondition for that to work is that it's okay to make mistakes. So mistakes within this um, team, within this environment, should be seen as learning opportunities instead of something to avoid. Because very early on in the design process, of, of course, there will be in inefficiencies. There will be things that are wrong. There will be things that have been overlooked. All of this should be taken as an opportunity for learning instead of something to avoid. Now, when you are running your own inner source initiative within your organization, something that is important to understand is that there is a reason for doing that. There is a reason for running these projects that way. In order to get your colleagues on board to work that way, you will have to think of the challenges that you want to address and you will have to explain them. Now, what I would like to see you think about is three challenges that you would like to address within your organization by bringing open source collaboration practices in your own team. Again, head over to our little etherpad and answer the question. I'll give you a minute because I really just want like the first few things that you can think of. Okay, some of the reasons that I can think of. Some of the reasons for introducing inner source would be to increase team collaboration. It would be crossing silo, uh, team silos so that teams learn from each other, so that they notice that some of the challenges that they are solving are present in multiple teams. So essentially, they can work together to move faster, essentially like we've done in open source across organizational boundaries, where one of the benefits is that you will gain by sharing. And you will gain not only through the feedback on your patch that you give back, but you can also work together across organization boundaries in order to work on infrastructure and in order to work together on the base level. So it doesn't really make any difference to your customer, but which makes everyone in the, in the space move much faster. So if you want to roll out your inner source initiative tomorrow, my advice would be to focus on the problems that you have. Don't overpromise, but look at your own team. What are the problems that you can solve? One of the problems that we used to have in my own organization was that within one team, a lot of senior team members had moved on to a more management schedule, but they still could provide decent feedback um, in terms of technology. Now, what they couldn't do anymore based on their schedule was to do pair programming with other colleagues, simply because this wouldn't al align very well anymore. There, there were much less synchronization points where this kind of work in a pairing pr um, setup would work. What we did instead was to pull them in to do code reviews not at the end of a feature as a quality gate, but on a continuous basis. Like, have a look, this is what we've come up with. Do you have any hints for us on how to make that better? Or is this direction that we're going to roughly correct? So we could keep them in the loop. We could keep their knowledge in the team and still work in an asynchronous fashion without the immediate need to have them on a day-to-day pairing session. So you start with your very local problems that you want to solve and you address those piece by piece. Also, it's advisable to use the tooling that you have already in place where possible. What you need to understand is that 
it's not necessarily the mailing list that is the key deciding factor that the Apache way is successful. What is important is that you have a communication medium that is written so that everyone can participate asynchronously, that is archived, like at Apache can go back to the 19th to figure out where that web server was coming from, and that as this archive is searchable. After all, you don't want to read all of the emails from the last 20 plus years in order to figure out um, this one piece of information that you're after. So what you have to find is a communication hub, like a central communication hub for your inner source project, where communication is written down, archived, searchable, and where messages can be linked. Why linked? Well, nobody nobody's going to read your documentation, and fairly few people are going to search your archive. But you know that that answer to the question is in there, so you can quickly go pull it up and post the link to the user. Next time it comes up, maybe someone from your contributors is going to do the same or is going to reuse your link. So no longer typing out answers over and over again and no longer verbally repeating them over and over again. You also want to integrate into existing processes where that is possible so that it feels connected and integrated in your organization and not like something external. When you start rolling out your inner source initiative, you want to connect with a few people. You don't want to work on that alone. Who you want to find is people who will help you on to advance the topic. Of course, they're supporting you, so that's very nice. But you also want to find people who would block the topic. You want to address their fears. You want to first understand their fears and then potentially address them. And you want to talk to these people both individually, but also together in a large meeting. It has proven successful in my case to keep these meetings informal because as you cross silos and as you cross team boundaries, there's often politics involved, there's often sort of a distrust involved. Keeping it informal, potentially over a meal, helps with this trust building experience. To keep this a sustainable effort, you want to establish an internal community of practice, which meets regularly, so that people know that there is a regularity and there is something that they can, can rely on. And of course, you want to keep the link to the external Intelsource Commons Foundation, not only because the material is continuously developing, but also as soon as you have findings within your organization, what you can do is write those up as a pattern and submit it to the foundation. What that means is, again, you get valuable feedback. What I have seen happens is that your pattern suddenly um, gets transformed to a format where it generalizes much better across team boundaries. And it typically within your organization, you will find the same challenges within different teams. So it helps to write up some things that you've seen once or twice in your organization in a structured way. And people in the patterns group will help you with that. Now let's take a minute again, head over to our other pad and think about which people in your organization should you talk to to get things started. And I'm not really after names here. I'm more after which roles should be you'd be talking to or why should you be talking to person X in order to get things started? Which are the um, roles that you have to get on board and why.
Okay, to summarize, ideally, in an ideal world, what we want to do is to cut dependencies in order to move faster. We don't want to wait for others. However, real reality is a lot more complicated. If we think about the Mars rover Perseverance, we know that even this um, scientific device has a ton of dependencies to open those projects even. If you go to GitHub right now, you will see batches on various open source developers who have source code that made it to Mars. So there are a ton of dependencies that we have to deal with. However, there is light at the end of the tunnel because open source shows the success of cross-team collaboration. Open source shows that even across organizational boundaries, even across cultural boundaries, and even across time zones, we can build bridges and we can build software together. So what I would like to see organizations do is to use those best practices internally in order to build better organizations, but also really in order to teach other engineers just how easy it is to get active upstream and just how much value there is in being active. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. So hello, everyone. We're back uh, and now we're live. <laughs> uh, and I have Isabel with me. Hi. So I, I found it very interesting with a live session. I'm not sure if we have anything you want to comment on the Etherpad. We do not have questions at the YouTube stream at the moment. Um, but if you feel like commenting something there, or if anyone wants to ask a question in the YouTube stream, for idle ears. So from what I see in the Etherpad, it's a, what I like to see the worst set of answers where most of the answers don't match what I had in mind, but which teaches me that, yes, sure, this is an effect as well. Or, yeah, that's something else that we should learn in inner source from open source, where in open source it's just natural and normal. <laughs> so I could ask a question from my side. Uh, when introducing this, would you see that it's a journey towards open source so that it helps? Does it help yes. the adoption or the, adop or the contribution? Or where do you see the? I think both. But I believe that many organizations already know that open source has won. So I do see open source as a basis for development in many organizations. What I have seen both at my own employer, but also looking towards other people, is that once people start practicing internally, it becomes much easier to become active upstream because you know the tooling, you know the processes, you know kind of where expectation management can be find, found. So even with my own employer, I do have colleagues who before were like, yeah, it could be interesting to become up, active upstream or where people were thinking about open sourcing stuff themselves on their own GitHub profile and who through InnoSource have learned the value of contributing back to existing projects, projects instead of publishing their own plugins somewhere where nobody's finding them, and where they learned how to go through that process. So it also sets the intention of the entire movement, right? What we need in open source is not many more published packages. It's also not many more users, but what we need to make this movement sustainable is more maintainers and more people becoming active. So what I've seen at Apache is that a lot of the people who become active at first have been downstream users and then have started fixing issues. And that's essentially the same in open source as in open source. But thank you very much for your talk. Thank you for your invitation. Bye-bye <laughs> and bye -bye. have a nice afternoon.